present today on uh, proximate exposures, media and radiance. So Rahul Mukherjee is Associate Professor of Television and New Media and Cinema Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. His recent book, 2020 book, Radiant Infrastructures, Media, Environment and the Cultures of Uncertainty, explores the ecological dimensions of media and energy infrastructures like cell towers and nuclear reactors. Rahul uh, presently serves on the editorial collective of the Journal of Visual Culture and the, and the editorial advisory board of Media and Environment. The discussant today is uh, Veena Hariharan, uh, who is who's sitting by my side actually, uh, and we'll just zoom, zoom on to her. Yeah, there she is. So Veena, Veena is Associate Professor of Cinema Studies at the School of Arts and Aesthetics, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University. Her essays and articles on, on the hunting archives in colonial India, freeway infrastructures and black experimental cin uh, cinema, have water ecologies in contemporary documentary film have been uh, appearing in various anthologies and journals. So what the structure of today is a bit like this. Uh, so I'm going to say a few words on the framework of the talk today. Uh, and and uh, then we move on to Rahul. Then we move on to Rahul. And uh, Rahul will speak for around uh, 25, 30 minutes. Uh, after that, Veena will come in as the discussant and speak for 10, 12 minutes. Following that, the discussion opens. If you have any questions, please send them in the chat function. Uh, we'll be happy to uh, present them to the audience. So what is today about? So today's talk uh, crosses the discipline of media studies, the environmental humanities, and science and technology studies. The framing ground of today's event is the problematization of two categories, that of infrastructure and that of media. Along with this come the notions of public and publicity, the idea of the political expertise and popular technocultural mobilizations. So technological infrastructures have typically been objects of collective fantasy. Today, they are enmeshed in a larger relationality, which often exceed their intention and purpose. This produces fierce contests over authority, standards and safety. Most distinctly, I think, and this comes across beautifully in Rahul's recent book, infrastructures are porous and contagious. They shape and attach new formations. They radiate, as Rahul argues in his remarkable book. What you see are new theaters of public debate and conflict over, 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 over infrastructure, which shapes new publics. The larger framework here is the expansion of media from distinct, almost partition sites, like television, cinema, radio. So what you have now is media as a collective plural a generalized condition of all forms, different forms of life making. This deeply affects, and this will come across in our discussion, this deeply affects what was once designated as experience, which was once seen as distinctly human. Experience now expands to relations between humans, animals, materials, materials, animals, humans. So therefore, the first problematic, we see the expansion of the idea of media to the medial, which again, uh, Rahul signposts. And this is a larger condition of the environmental contemporary. And remember here, the environment is a larger set of relations between media, uh, populations, materials, right? Air, water, radiation, now pandemics. All these are, all these forms are part of this expanded medial condition. It demands vast amounts of data, expertise, new gadgetry, and techniques of endless visualization and representation. There's a kind of demand for representation and new techniques of representation. Right? So therefore, the medial calls forth very distinct challenges and constant productive uncertainty. So here, what are the relations between human, non-human, and political affect? Obviously, when you reassemble or seen, it, it, it seems to reassemble, it demands a kind of thinking about these conditions. So what happens to political affect? How do we see mediation in this large, larger universe, if it's not just mediation in the old sense? So I think this condition is, 
generative of a kind of technological uncanny which lurks in this medial condition. How do you mediate or distill what you cannot see, but maybe you experience? Uh, we have seen this in this pandemic as new expertise is regularly mobilized, incessantly, every day mobilized to stabilize a constantly shifting scientific truth. Bodies enter unseen conditions and contagions. A vast amount of data vis visualization is circulated every day. Uh, it, 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 it defines our life, right? So the surplus and ref refractions of energy are a key element in this scenario. And this actually is the thrust of Rahul's uh, enterprise in, in this book. So now I will uh, turn over to Rahul uh, for his presentation. So Rahul, uh, the, the, the screen is yours. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Ravi. That was uh, really helpful discussion. Thanks also for um, um, uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, share uh, uh, my work here. And thanks to Veena for uh, being the discussant and respondent. It's truly an honor to be uh, speaking on this forum with uh, Sarai and CSDS. So the presentation is mostly uh, based on the fourth chapter of my book, um, but towards the end of the talk, I'll also try to gesture towards uh, some of the new work I'm trying to do in time permitting, but then I could also do that during the uh, Q&A. Uh, so I'll just uh, share my screen. Uh, so, as I said, mostly the fourth chapter, and uh, uh, I'll just briefly set the context before going to that chapter. Uh, uh, the first contextual sort of information would be more uh, mostly the empirical one, uh, but another time I'll just go back again to some of the concepts I discuss in the book, something that uh, Ravi also alluded to around intermediality and environmental publics, um, uh, but that would be in the second iteration. And I'll try to read a little bit, but also talk through the slides. Um, uh, so hopefully it should be uh, good. Following the uh, Fukushima catastrophe and amid protests by Kudan Kulam fishermen about the effects of increasing radiation levels on their lives and livelihoods, construction work at the nuclear power plant in Tamil Nadu came to a halt in September 2011. The nuclear establishment um, faced a crisis of accountability and in order to gain public acceptance for the project, it went on an aggressive publicity campaign about the virtues of nuclear power. These efforts were countered by anti-nuke activists who deployed their own mediations to shape public perception about the dangers posed by nuclear reactors. So, the, so this is uh, Nuclear Power Corporation of India Limited, NPCIL's ad about you know, brightening millions of lives, bringing electricity to agricultural fields. Um, and on the other side, uh, Fatima Nizaruddin's uh, documentary, Nuclear Hallucinations. Meanwhile, in urban centers, Indian citizens were deeply concerned about news reports that residents living in close proximity to mobile phone towers were being diagnosed with cancer, sleeplessness, irritability. Owing to radiation's ability to evade the human senses, popular news programs in India characterize cell tower signals as Khamosh Khatra, silent danger. One of the first reports was uh, Jan 3rd, 2010, uh, Bombay's uh, midday. By examining a series of environmental controversies associated with nuclear reactors and cell tower, this book conceptualizes the specificity of radiant infrastructures as a particular kind of infrastructure. Radiant infrastructures, like other infrastructures, provide structure to our lives. They organize our mobility. Cell phones keep us connected as we move and shape the way we use our electrical appliances. Nuclear reactors produce electricity. Radiant infrastructures more particularly are associated with radiance, understood as fields of energy. The signals emitted by cell antennas move like waves across the city, determining which phones stay connected and which don't. These signals enter people's homes, disturbing erstwhile notions of public private boundaries. Radioactive isotopes emitted by nuclear reactors also defy boundaries, 
finding their way into water, soil, and human bodies. Such radioactive nuclides accumulate in animals and plants, resurfacing and concentrating as they go up the food chain. I also here must mention that all radiations are not the same, and the two different uh, infrastructures I'm discussing emit very different kinds of radiation. So for nuclear reactors and, and nuclear waste, a different kind of like ionizing radiation, alpha particles, beta particles, gamma rays, um, different uh, CCM isotopes. On the other end, non-ionizing um, radio frequency electromagnetic fields uh, from, from cell antennas. Uh, and that difference is important. And as much as the other differences are important, which are about the fact that nuclear reactor sites were mostly in, in rural areas being set up um, and um, while the cell antenna siting issues are mostly in sort of um, densely populated urban centers. Um, so I attended a bunch of like demonstrations using uh, microwave ovens, um, trying to sort of um, explain how microwave ovens could be used as a way to understand uh, cell antenna signals. Here you have Surendra Gadekar, longtime Gandhian anti-nuclear activist in uh, Anand Patwardhan's Jangar Aman uh, War and Peace uh, documentary. And this is um, uh, Hiroaki Koede from, from Japan coming um, to test some samples of radioactivity in the uranium mines of Jadugora in Sri Prakash's uh, Nabikye. He's another documentary, of course, on the Jadugora uranium mines, uh, Buddha Veeps in Jadugora. Radiant infrastructures thereby uh, becomes a heuristic that accretes the different ways people try to make sense of radiation emitting technologies and their everyday encounters with them. So and I was particularly interested in thinking uh, about infrastructures, both in their kind of everyday encounters with ordinary people as they walked around uh, their lives and uh, also the aspect of infrastructures as projects of the state. Um, so kind of the national imaginaries as well as a very quotidian imaginaries of, of, of infrastructures. Uh, but to come to specifically the radiance. So the radiance of radiant infrastructures is a double-edged sword because these infrastructures are at once harbingers of development and emitters of potentially carcinogenic um, radiations. Um, uh, these images um, are um, from the Sakri Nathir village uh, where Areva is building its nuclear reactor um, in Jaitapur. A key research question for this book is how does considering radiation reconfigure the way we approach infrastructures? Radiant infrastructures are not spatially restricted to their tangible materialities. They in fact cast a wider net through the effects of their imperceptible emissions that scatter and spread. While conceptualizing the infraness of radiant infrastructures, scholars simply cannot confine themselves to studying the visibility and or invisibility of cell towers and nuclear reactors. They must account for the invisible radiations. And yet radiations themselves are not enough to comprehend the epistemic and political orders governing such infrastructures. For that, one would have to study the mediations of such radiant energies. So I'll, I'll go to uh, how in chapter four, I'm thinking about media and radiance uh, together. So this talk and this particular book chapter examines the exposure of human bodies to radiations. Two questions are critical here. How do various media portray the proximity of people living close to reactors and towers and how do these media capture bodily exposure to emissions by such radiant infrastructures? And I think maybe a quick note on how proximity and intimacy are somewhat different. And I'm here following the lead of Kath Weston's work um, in, Fuk uh, in Fukushima and Tokyo at, at that point of time. So while depicting the proximity of human bodies to hypervisible and by now conspicuous infrastructures, such as cell towers and nuclear reactors is easy, making perceptible the intimacy signals is difficult. It is important here to parse out the distinction between proximity and intimacy. Proximity connotes spatial contiguity, and intimacy, while certainly folding in proximity, allows for suffusion and permeability. Thus, human bodies in being tangibly and spatially proximate to nuclear reactors and cell, cell antennas end up sharing micro-level intimacies with radioactive nucleides and wireless signals. So I'll, I'll think through this distinction uh, throughout this uh, talk. Uh, post Fukushima, when the protests against construction of new nuclear plants intensified in India, the nuclear establishment decided to rebrand itself. In collaboration with uh, the National Geographic Channel, NPCIL launched a series of advertisements. One particular ad, however, goes beyond framing nuclear energy as illuminating lives through the power of the atom, something we saw earlier in the slide. 
It portrays the proximate encounters between living beings and nuclear reactors as benign, thus promoting the reactors as safe technologies producing clean and green energy. We see a, and so I'm talking about this particular image. We see a bird perching on a slender twig in the foreground as clean white smoke comes out of NPCL furnaces in the background. The ad sells nuclear as clean energy and espouses corporate social responsibility tactics, all the while blurring the boundaries between nature and nuclear technology. Here they not only coexist, but also share a kins kinship. They form what Arturo Escobar and Joseph Masco have called techno natures. The ad emphasizes the idea that a nuclear plant as nature reserve is not a paradox. Nuclear plants do not threaten the environment, rather technology and nature seamlessly blend together. I mean, in some of the, uh, throughout the ad, you would see sort of zoom ins and extreme close ups of butterflies sucking nectar, animals emerging from burrows and a number of rare bird species going about their everyday lives. Uh, the ad asserts that the intimacy between birds and nuclear reactors is perfectly plausible. An oppositional reading of the NPCIL ad instead of seeing a seamless blending of technology and nature argues for the precarious existence of a bird so close to a reactor. This perspective, and I'm not talking about this image, uh, was uh, demonstrated by the anti-nuke uh, documentary filmmaker R.P. Amudan, whose documentary Radiation Stories 3 Kudankulam portrays communities living close to the Kudankulam nuclear reactor in southern India and was made in solidarity with the protests against it. In one scene, Amudan shows a woman feeding a goat in the same line of vision as the nuclear reactor. When I interviewed Amudan, he mentioned that unlike the Nat Geo and PCIL ad, he wanted to juxtapo juxtapose, quote, life, woman and goat, and death, quote, nuclear reactor. There is no blend of technology and nature here, rather there's a dissonance. The nuclear reactor will soon displace the woman and the goat and thus expel the woman from both her place and her livelihood. In July 2013, I was present at a convention in Ahmedabad where the People's Charter Against Nuclear Energy was to be drafted. There I heard Xavier Amba, a member of the affected community in the Idantikarai village, whose house was close to the reactor. A staunch critic of nuclear energy, Xavier Amba asked why, if the nuclear reactor is really as safe as NPCL claims, it is not being built close to the Parliament of India and Prime Minister's house. In a similar vein, Yashvir Arya, who lives close to the Gorakhpur village in Haryana, where another nuclear reactor is being built, asked why an atomic power plant is not being erected next to the president's house in New Delhi. He sarcastically reasoned that the electricity produced by the plant could help light up all 340 rooms of the Rashtrapati Bhavan, presidential palace. This rhetoric aimed at the Indian government's hypocrisy suggests that some lives in India are considered less privileged and less valuable. One could even say that the government creates a perpetually long lasting exception around the energy security issues and uses its sovereign powers to decide who to protect and who to let die. The urban elite who seem so anxious about cell towers, um, um, which need to be in the city for them to have cellular coverage are not that bothered about nuclear reactors because they're being built away from the city. And this is something that I was chatting with somebody again at this conference in Ahmedabad and I was gonna take the night train to Bombay. And I said, I was gonna to talk to some of the concerned citizens around regulating uh, cell antennas. And this particular anti-nuke activist said that, uh, you know, the city dwellers are not bothered about uh, anti-nuclear protests. Um, they're bothered about cell antennas. So he was sort of suggesting a certain kind of NIMBYism associated with, uh, not in my backyardism associated with, with cell antenna uh, uh, movement, the movement to evict cell antennas. Um, to sort of just put this in perspective in terms of the difference in infrastructures. Uh, so in comparison, the signals from a cell antenna are far more directed and targeted than nuclear radiation. In case of non-ising electromagnetic radiation, much depends on the direction of the main beam and the angle at which the apartment and antenna face each other. Documentary filmmakers took out the plight of rural fishermen affected by nuclear reactors and lifestyle shows like CNN, IBN, I guess CNN News 18's um, Living It Up, which is a lifestyle show, um, sort of connecting lifestyle choices made by urban dwellers to health issues and concerns. So documentary filmmakers took up the plight of rural fishermen affected by nuclear reactors and lifestyle shows depicted elite urbanites concerned about cell antennas near their houses. Even though the preferred channel of mediation was different in the two controversies, both types framed the affected populations and the radiant infrastructures in one single image or shot. So in this case, you've Carmen Nair, uh, who is depicted uh, sitting in her house just outside the window. You can see a tower and she expressed her concern for it, uh, having to sort of live in uh, the vicinity of the towers signals uh, all through day and night. Um, this is Rabani Garg, um, who mentions how um, 
she was looking for what really happened with her um, daughter who was diagnosed with um, brain cancer. And that one of the things she finally noticed and she hadn't noticed before, because they're just out there, she says, was these uh, cell antennas. And in this lifestyle show, you see her again, like giving this kind of situated testimony, testimony at the site of her sort of first encounter with the cell tower and kind of trauma. So, uh, Living It Up, uh, this particular show took up the cell tower scare issue in an episode that aired on October 6, 2012 and sought to represent the affective encounters between cell towers and human bodies. Um, and particularly these testimonies, it, it of course used all kinds of things like the episode presents carefully staged shots of children walking in a line with a tower looming over them. A dusky color palette provides expressiveness to the scene, which is shot from a low angle with the camera tilted up, emphasizing the height of tower, a soundtrack of metallic percussion instruments, electronic disturbance and ringing phones accompany scenes throughout the show, often layered over narration voices and patient testimonies like that of Carmel Nair and Rabani Garg. So despite these, um, despite their emotional and affective chart, could situated testimonies, that is testimonies like Nair's delivered at the site of an event or problem count as evidence. During the cell tower radiation controversy, the term anecdotal evidence was invoked by a particular group of experts to question public claims of symptoms such as sleeplessness, depression, and cancer due to living in proximity to cell towers and or overuse of mobile phones. In the cell tower con radiation controversies where experts confess to not knowing the long-term effects and are unable to arrive at a consensus about the permissible level of radiation, anecdotal evidence attains particular salience in shaping public perception and making the state more responsive to the needs of the citizens. We can observe instances of the presentation of anecdotal evidence in the newspaper Rajasthan Patrika. So there's a lot of like expertise, counter expertise, scientists saying something, dissident scientists saying something. Uh, real uh, concerns and uh, debates around as Ravi was also mentioning about threshold levels of what amount of signals should be considered the threshold beyond which one has to regulate, um, so on and so forth. So uh, different also with contested measurements, different um, the telecom enforcement regulatory monetary uh, of the uh, monetary board of the government would have uh, would go and do measurements and then um, um, another group like the cogent EMR solutions would go and they would have very different uh, uh, measurements and the reasons could be because it's kind of difficult to have uh, uh, the same kind of signals because the signals vary based on uh, the amount of cellular traffic, the, the built environment, uh, weather, so on and so forth. So many, many factors sort of playing into this kind of uncertainty. But to talk more about a similar kind of, you know, situated testimony, anecdotal evidence in a different kind of media format, uh, the local newspaper, and it's kind of very hyper-localized coverage in Rajasthan Patrika. So uh, you could see that they had this Bhatti Meshahar city inside the uh, furnace kind of a campaign at that point of time uh, related to cell, cell antennas. Several images of concerned citizens in Jaipur appeared as part of Patrika's coverage of the radiation story. These citizens who were affected patients or relatives of sick people appeared in the foreground, either wielding measurement devices or pointing an accusatory finger at the set of mobile towers in the background. Such photographs almost give the impression that people like to see themselves in the newspapers. In the pictures, the tower was always nearby, just across the street or on the terrace of the adjoining house, looming an ominous shadow set to engulf the city. Consider this example, and this is uh, Mani Ramji here. Uh, Mani Ramji is shown standing on the terrace of his bungalow. He's holding the signal measure measurement instrument with LEDs on his right hand, and his index finger is pointing to the red light, conveying that radiation levels are dangerous. He's framed against the backdrop of the tower that is responsible for harmful radiation. It is a self-consciously staged image, staged image. Another image in the same article shows a couple wielding the radiation de detectors as um, as three towers loom behind them. Patrika journalists went to many neighborhoods in Jaipur responding to complaint letters from the readers and were able to portray the individual experiences of the residents. Such a door-to-door -door, or rather rooftop to rooftop or rather chat to chat campaign highlighted the situated knowledges and here I'm citing Donna Haraway of the locals suffering from the deleterious effects of nearby towers. And I mean, um, perhaps at a later point I would uh, talk more about this, but uh, there is the way in which this kind of news circulates um, has a lot to do with Patrika thinking of it as a kind of community newspaper. Um, when I was thinking about this issue, I was also interning at a, a science magazine in, in, in New Delhi. 
And um, the reporters there would tell me that they found Patrika's coverage, that as much as there was scientific uncertainty about this, they thought Patrika's coverage was too um, communitarian, that, is, uh, that they were not checking the facts. And when I mentioned this to the Patrika editors, they mentioned that, yes, there is the science is not clear on this, but we do want to take our community's concerns. So it's an interesting kind of a clash here uh, between what the priorities of, of, of these different journalists were. Um, so network media systems shape uncertainty, citizenship claims, and different environmentalisms about radiation and radiant infrastructures, thereby gathering or forestalling publics around them. Um, and these are the critical kind of conceptual terms in my books. So I'll get back to the book again and then back to the chapter again. Um, by foregrounding the critical terms environmental publics and intermediality in the various chapters, I want the readers of the book to carefully attend to the relationship between mediation and radiance of infrastructures. So uh, clearly, if one of the things I've been trying to establish is that um, one way to think about infrastructures and study infrastructural publics are this idea of issue-based publics taken certainly from John Dewey later on, worked through by Bruno Latour and uh, Nuche Maris and others which is thinking about these kinds of stakeholders um, in the case of say the cell antenna controversy or the nuclear reactor controversy and trying to look at the interactions between them. And in my case, of course, media plays a role, gives these venues like the talk shows or the lifestyle show for some of these interactions to happen. It could also be a documentary filmmaker like R.P. Amudan covering a public hearing around the environmental impact assessment of nuclear reactors. So that's one way to think about it, but certainly issue-based publics is not all that is there. The idea of split publics about how different newspapers in different um, in urban and rural areas covered the um, covered the, the the issue differently. Um, about how uh, the kind of um, way in which the state looks at uh, the fisherman community and the nuclear reactor issue is very different from the way they were they were thinking about these so-called concerned citizens belonging to resident welfare associations in, in cities. And, and certainly some of the kind of Vatha Chatterjee's categories of civil society and political society were helpful and their kind of interrogations and critiques by Ajay Gudavarti and Nandini uh, Sundar were also helpful as I was thinking through ways of, the ways in which some of the organizational aspects of um, advocating for some of these concerns by very different groups were. Um, Shiju Varugese's work on thinking about the civil society, political society categories in terms of scientific citizen publics and quasi publics uh, in the way they overlap with the civil society, political society aspects was also helpful. Um, uh, Breckenridge and Apadurai's work on public culture, extremely helpful. So was Michael Warner's work on a kind of uh, constitutive circularity of publics, certainly interested in publicity and how uh, some of this information, misinformation, fear, psychosis was circulating. Uh, and certainly also legitimate concerns were for circulating. Uh, particularly for this uh, chapter, as um, Ravi was alluding to, uh, is a kind of way of thinking about atmospheric media. Um, the pub Necht and Oscar Necht and Klu uh, Alexander Kluger's work from the Frankfurt School, a kind of rejoinder to Habermas's notion of public sphere was important where um, Necht and Kluger argue that public sphere is not just about institutions, about uh, civic spaces of, of, of interaction, but it's also about social horizon of experience. So I'll talk more about that uh, uh, later on as I discuss uh, more of the sort of atmospheric aspects in this, in this chapter, just to think about how I was thinking more about these kinds of interactions between different stakeholders. So uh, a show like We the People would be one way, um, uh, you know, with, with, with different, uh, with different uh, another show could be The Mirror Now with, uh, talking to these different stakeholders, but it could also be uh, Amudan covering uh, a kind of public hearing. Again, Michael Warner's work about how publics is a kind of poetics uh, of address, that there is a kind of poesis of address, that there is a kind of poetic world making in the way people are addressed uh, in one's neighborhood, in one's community, in a, in a city like Jaipur was also uh, central to sort of thinking about uh, publics. Um, intermediality is key and Ravi already thankfully has alluded to how I'm thinking through the media and media. Uh, so I'll just say a little briefly, the concept of intermediality accounts for relations among media texts and forms covering a particular environmental controversy, as well as the interactions between the media technologies assembled to demonstrate radiation. So it's, it's both about kind of seeing how 
the controversy and the debate moves from say a lifestyle show where Rabani Garg talks about her daughter Risa, but also and Cell Towers and she goes then to a talk show like um, We the People and also talks about it. So it's to think about those, those two different sort of talk show and lifestyle show in relation to one another as, uh, as the kind of cell tower radiation debate um, circulates. But it's also about um, these exercises of using aluminum foils and microwave ovens to demonstrate radiations, of course, radiation detectors as well. Um, media becomes a complex assemblage or still better a practice in the making where particular radiation monitoring technologies and environmental concerns as well as bodies and politics uh, quote and i'm quoting jennifer gabriz here concretize into specific occasions that can galvanize citizen sensing unquote in stressing media relations intermediality becomes a useful concept to foreground how media is part of socio-materially situated practices of radiation detection and citizen participation so I'm um, certainly thinking about uh, mediated texts, also media technologies, but media are not just uh, technologies, but also techniques and practices. And here I was very interested in this kind of practice of, of, of making palpable uh, invisible signals and invisible radiation. So there are of course chapters which think through other ideas of publics and media with you know radiation hotspots hot marked, um, uh, crowdsourced ways of thinking about uh, cell antenna signal levels. Um, and uh, as I said, like uh, thinking about publics, I was very interested also in how different uh, communities organize differently, different movements organize differently. So um, this kind of like um, uh, protesting by sleeping in the night on the beach, one kind of like sort of a more people's movement idea of, of protests vis-a-vis -a, -vis a more sort of a concerned citizen idea in the case of cell towers in this case and as much as the cell tower um, eviction of cell tower movement was was very much tinged with a certain kind of nimbyism there were certainly gross violations of um of um the kind of regulatory uh, regulations that were under place as you can sort of see in this case uh, kind of the cell antennas atop um, this whole cluster on on a two-floored hotel supreme apartment and this kind of proximity as i've talked about uh, people started making their own kind of videos as a way to document proof that you know regulatory concerns were being kind of violated um, each time even though they had a kind of municipal corporation uh, of the brihunwami mumbai uh, municipal corporation had sort of off um, ordered a stay um, this particular concerned citizen sort of made a video as he was just looking at his morning newspaper and found that there were new maintenance workers who were putting up uh, more cell antennas at that point of time. So um, this too happened. But let me get back to, I've, I've talked quite a lot about proximity, but I want to talk a bit more on the sort of atmospheric front about the invisible uh, radiation particles and rays. Uh, so I'll talk a bit about dosage. Um, The, the dosimeter attached uh, to a nuclear worker's body gives an indication of the radioactive dose imbibed. Workers who spend many years at nuclear reactors are trained to perceive through their dosimeter readings the shifts in radiation level, level as they move across different zones, from the nuclear fuel loading area to the spent fuel storage tank, from the turbine engine to the control room. The environment keeps changing and the medium of perception pragmatic exercise and also an exercise of asserting control, control over the atom, control over emissions, control over radiogenic injury. The inside series of National Geographic involved journalists touring an Indian nuclear reactor in one episode titled Tarapu Nuclear Plant, Unlock Power. In one scene of this particular episode, the anchor comes from a zone of high radiation intensity and is inspected by other nuclear workers to check whether he's within the prescribed radiation limits. The anchor is depicted wearing a thermoluminescent dosimeter TLD batch and carrying another direct reading dosimeter DRD. The health physicist explains that the DRD is used to a certain immediate dosage the journalist has received and the cumulative radiation is recorded in the TLD, which is sent to the plant's computer records. But is the security system really that compact? Is not the determination of the permissible dose a somewhat arbitrary ex exercise? Measuring and understanding exposure can lead to holding governments and corporations accountable for radiation-related illnesses. That being said, radiogenic injury is difficult to ascertain because it can take decades to manifest. And such a latency period, as Shannon Cram 
has argued in regard to workers at the United States Hanford nuclear site, quote, introduces doubt about the source of cancer, mutation, and birth effects. Whether in a uranium mine or a nuclear reactor, the scientific way of ascertaining radioactivity inside nuclear bodies of calculation, calculating radiation exposure is determining dosage. External radiation for uranium miners involves exposure to gamma rays from radioactive rocks. Miners also inhale the particles released from uranium and radon decay. And the particles continue to spit nucleides inside the miner's body. This is what is called internal radiation. Uranium miners intricately encounter radiation, both internal and external, and the alpha particles inside their bodies produce varying inscriptions on their skin, lumps, moles, swollen limbs. Some documentarians in India have taken up this channel by obsessively showing the very visible effects of invisible radiation on human bodies, and therefore damning the government for unleashing violence on its own citizens. However, many devast devastating effects of radiation simply cannot be seen on the surface of human bodies. Other mediational strategies have included looking for traces of such unwanted intimacies, Kath Weston's term in biomedical imaging of human bodies through X-ray plates and CD scans of radioactive signatures on bodies and electroencephalogram EEG tests inscribing the... So there's a, a lot of discussion about the, the nuclear body and a kind of standard about the, about the, the dosages which are permissible. Uh, there's a kind of reference man discussion also in, in, in the sort of atomic literature. But what, what, what is so crucial, and, and this is also uh, going back to a kind of documentary way of representing this in some of the minim Minamata poisoning cases by the Japanese documentarian Tsuchimoto, where he shows that the kind of expressiveness of a, of a nuclear body, the way it responds is kind of a unique signature at each time for each body. And this is something I, I found particularly, uh, I mean, as much as some of these documentary filmmakers also take up this kind of scientific route of, of showing just the different categories of illnesses through the kind of bodily marks, there was also this idea that, that, that each case was unique and special in its own way and needed its own kind of story. But in the, in the process of storytelling, and that's what comes across, um, I think particularly in some of Amudan's work, in his kind of the, the three-part trilogy of radiation stories one, two, and three. This particular one, uh, this image is of a pile cancer patient uh, who worked in the kind of rare earth mining area in Maniwala Kuruchi. And he shot lying on his side, his head resting on the pillow. He sh shot at an angle so that his whole body is in the frame. At the beginning of the interview, the man talks but does not face the camera. He seems to be conversing with a person who is sitting either standing above and beside the interview. What, what happens to the interview, and I'll not go into uh, the details per se, but um, each time Amudan asks a question, the person deflects, talks about something else, blows a flower, uh, a petal here. Um, uh, the interview has to stop midway through because he has to go to the restroom. He can't go, he's lying down. But Amudan continues. And at some level, this is a kind of obsessive extraction, perhaps. But what also comes through in Amudan's work about his kind of slow pacing and these kinds of camera movements is this idea of a total breakdown of, of the testimonial apparatus. And I found that, that that was somewhat generative as a way of thinking about, um, about what is that great difference that we talk about sometimes in a kind of politically committed documentary film, which one doesn't get in these kinds of uh, quickly shot uh, televised uh, interviews. Um, so it is these spaces of reticence, and I'm using a term Jason Alley uses, those uneasy silences, ignored questions, vacuous smiles or blank stares that lay open the testimonial documentary apparatus of knowledge production and contest the notion that local experiences and knowledge is can be easily grasped by elites or even documentary audiences from the outside. The testifiers demonstrate through their bodies and behaviors what they cannot articulate through language. The bodily experiences of pain and illness suffered by radiated testifiers will perhaps always defy language, but such experiences also form, quote, the potential for humane community. Um, Amudan's unhurried camera movements and slow pacing stitch together their bodily sensations and unstable feelings, producing a shared sense making of the effects of nuclearization. From what is made visible and sensible about these situated and expressive nuclear bodies, we know that there is much more that we do not yet understand. So this is I, I suppose, two ways of thinking about dosage, a uh, NAD Geo uh, uh, feature report and Amudan's documentary. Um, I'll talk a little bit about interference, which is the kind of standard again to talk about 
uh, uh, about uh, electromagnetic bodies, uh, particularly by electrosensitives, uh, a particular group of people who uh, claim or suggest that they are sensitive to, to electromagnetic signals, um, the RF EMFs that I've uh, alluded to before. So back to the Living It Up show, another of its episode, um, and the anchor 3D Mandal subjects himself to a sleep test and gets wired to sensors in a sleep lab. His uh, mobile phone keeps buzzing all through the night and he has a restless sleep. This part of the ep episode is shot in night vision mode with little light, which helps the audience relate to Mandel's disconcerted feeling. The sleep specialist mentions in her observations that Mandel had fragmented sleep and delayed sleep onset. The sleep test maps waves of activity in the brain and heart to graphical waves on the electrocardiogram, EKG, or EEG monitors. These graphs are inscriptions of electromagnetic phenomena happening inside the human body. The electrodes and sensors placed on different parts of Mandel's body and head pick up voltage fluctuations generated by neural impulses deep inside. Such mediations of the human body transcend its flesh to place it in the context of electromagnetics. Writing about the possibility of electromagnetic pollution interfering with brain waves, the anthropologist Stefan Helmreich notes, quote, where there are electromagnetic waves, interference is never far behind. And this is the case when it comes to thinking with and through brains too. Monitoring mandal sleep becomes a biopolitical process of checking for any harmful interference between cell antenna signals and mandal's uh, cardiac and neural functions. When I asked Mandel about his decision to become an experimental subject, he, he replied, quote, it, it always works best if the reporter goes through the experience himself. That way the audience can find the whole show more believable. According to Mandel, including the personal self in the process of testing is a sign of legitimacy. In this scenario, there is both the affect of Mandel being put through a test and the affect of you as seeing Mandel's sensations inscribed in the form of graphs. Just to take through a very quick, and I'll be uh, concluding very soon, uh, this example from a medical drama, Holby City, uh, of this guy who comes uh, to the hospital complaining of um, irritability, of nausea, of vomiting, uh, and people don't seem to take him seriously. He keeps complaining, um, and then they suggest, okay, well, we're unable to find out what's really happening with you, and he has to go through this MRI test but he can't withstand the MRI test. And as soon as he's sort of put through that contraption, he yells and screams and has to be taken out. And, be, and many of the doctors in the hospital in that medical drama suggest that um, uh, this guy must be crazy, but Bernie Wolf, uh, one of the assistant surgeons, suggests that um, reasons that the patient has developed a hypersensitivity to EMFs because of his long-term exposure to broadband communications. It's suggested that he actually puts broadband communication equipment for for, for the elderly, and that's his profession. This has to be the reason why his body reacted negatively to the electromagnetic signals of the MRI machine, which we're trying to probe for aberrations, but were actually the cause of his discomfort. Wolf's hypothesis is proved correct when the patient begins to return to a normal condition once he's isolated in a room that does not have any Wi-Fi. And this is a particular case of electrosensitivity. Electrosensitives um, bring attention to the soaked up environmental milieu of radiant energies in addition to solid radiant infrastructures. If we are to comprehend the environmental effects of radiant infrastructures, we have to think more ecologically and relationally about their emissions. This means not only relating one radiant technology to another like the MRI machine to cell towers or broadband, but also considering the interference of radiant energies produced by human bodies MRI technologies and cell antennas that is moving from the mediatic level to the signalytic level. Paying attention to wavy and fluid radiant energies rather than solid uh, radiant infrastructures makes us notice the quote intervening medium of the air. And here again, citing Jennifer Gabriel's. The concept of intermediality is something that emphasizes the inter, as in the inter in betweenness of media, gets further betrayed as we think of the atmosphere between solid media objects and infrastructures as a medium as well. I've contended that the pub, um, so one needs to understand mediation not, not as some discrete media object or media text, but as an envelope around the social where matters of experience are as critical as matters of deliberation and discourse. The goal of this chapter and perhaps the stock thus has been to make the particular experiences and feelings of affected patients, as well as the micro level intimacies of their bodies that their bodies share with wireless signals and radio isotopes, radioactive isotopes, come to matter in environmental public discourse. Publics exist not only as conversations, but also as experiences. Oscar Necht and Alexander Kluge emphasized the need to study everyday experiences as part of investigating public spheres. They offered from within the Frankfurt School a rejoinder to 
Habermas's conceptualization of a con conversation oriented rational critical public sphere. They argue that public sphere, this is Necht and Kluger, the public sphere refers as much to institutions, establishments, and activities as it does to the quote social horizon of experience, which is something that has to do with everyone and which only realizes itself in the heads of human beings at dimension of their consciousness. While Necht and Kluge associate experience with the mind and consciousness, I've been using the term affect to connote both emotions and non-cognitive sensations. Putting emphasis on the embodied aspect of environment publics means we seriously consider the variety of human bodies and their different interactions with radiant infrastructures and, we, and that we do not believe in standard templates of one nuclear body on one electromagnetic body. I'm kind of done here. I wanted to talk a little bit about my new stuff around some of these questions of sensitivity around uh, uh, JC Bose's work, but I could wait till the end, whatever Ravi or Veena suggest. You can just do it, you know, you can just do it. You can. <laughs> okay. So in some of my new work, continuing with this question of sensitivity, I try to find a historically, culturally, and phenomenologically nuanced epistemology of wireless technology and to see how it is intermeshed with experiments and biophysics, specific, specific philosophies of vitalism and monism, and particular strands of feminist technoscience. I started researching the work of biophysicist uh, Jagdish Chandra Bose when the last decade of 19th century began manufacturing wireless de devices operating in the millimeter range to conduct scientific experiments on plant sensitivity. This is uh, in the, the, the Bose Museum in, in Calcutta. Some of today's 5G wireless waves operate in the same millimeter wave band, a coveted high frequency spectrum as Bose's scientific apparatus. So some 5G certainly does work in military, millimeter wave, but some of them are still continuing to be in microwave. At a Calcutta town hall in 1895, Bose used a spark gap transmitter to send a 60 hertz signal through three walls in the body of the region's lieutenant governor to a funnel shaped horn antenna and detector 23 meters away. Bose believed that plant, animal, and human matter were all powered by Mahashakti, Sanskrit for ultimate energy, and that wireless signals were interfering with this Mahashakti, a notion of energy similar to ether in its all encompassing quality. And Ashish Nandi, Virginia Shepherd, and others have written on this. I argue that Bose's theory of electromagnetic vibration allows for forging continuities across plant and human sensing, even though Bose's thesis slides too easily from plant sensing to plant consciousness and does not rigorously differentiate between the activities of sensing and feeling. I contend that an environmental media theory based on Bose's work helps us imagine community, communicative processes unfolding through electromagnetic pulsations and vibrations at various levels and scales of, of plants and environments, challenging existing regimes of perceptibility such a processual media theory pushes for including different perspectives on electrosensitivity and, and plant feelings. This is from um, Bose's book on Obacto, which is the undescribable or unsayable. So I'll end at that note. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rahul. Uh, that's really incredible. There's so much to think about, frankly, uh, you know, apart from from the from from your unique purchase on on on, on this and uh, really, you know, I think quite pioneering in 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 in, in the scholarship from South Asia. Uh, so there's a lot to think about. So I'm going to hand the floor over to Veena now uh, and, and Veena will will make her intervention. Yeah, uh, Rahul, thank you so much for that uh, wonderful presentation and also for that uh, final, you know, that last bit that you showed us that was just really quite uh, fantastic. And um, thank you also for your book. I mean, it was really like a fascinating book. Um, so um, I'm just going to make a few observations and um, in response to your presentation and uh, also to the book, more broadly speaking, because I, I guess a lot of people who are uh, attending today, participants may not have uh, read the book yet, because I don't think it has come uh, here. It has not yet reached India. I haven't got my copy either. So, um, but... Um, Watch out. So um, uh, the so-called infrastructural turn, right, um, highlighted by uh, Brian Larkin, Lisa Parks, 
Nicole uh, Sterosilski, Janet Walker, Sean Kibbutt, et al. Um, so uh, they urged uh, media scholars to shift their um, focus from medium as message, form, and content, uh, that is uh, from representation, narrative, and aesthetics to the big picture of scale, uh, materiality, and networks. Um, at the same time, a critical body of work on infrastructures, on electricity, cable, uh, satellite, tele uh, mobile telephony, internet, etc., um, that drive media systems um, has made it uh, possible now to study infrastructures uh, in terms of the cultural, um, political, social, sensory, and uh, ecological. Um, so the um, entanglements of uh, digital media infrastructures and uh, the environment uh, suggests itself in uh, ever more relevant ways. Uh, if you look, for example, uh, at the recent internet blackouts, at the farmers' protests, the Delhi borders, um, and uh, also the uh, arrest and uh, subsequent release of 22-year-old uh, uh, climate activist Disha Ravi, uh, for allegedly updating a uh, Google document, uh, the toolkit. Uh, the link has been uh, somewhat, um, I would say, arguably uh, with people in this room and uh, participants that um, arguably understudied uh, in the Indian media studies context. Of course, it's been studied separately, but uh, um, the, in relation to media, I think there has to be, uh, there's less work on that. And therefore, I think your book offers a pioneering, um, I would say pioneering exploration of um, you know, of media natures, what uh, Jussi Parika's uh, term for the sort of continuum of media with, uh, of media infrastructures and nature. So uh, Jussi Parika says, uh, media is of nature and returns to nature, right? Uh, so media here is a sort of uh, intimate uh, environmental participant, right? And you make that distinction between uh, proximity and intimacy uh, in, in productive ways, which uh, maybe we can talk about later. Um, and uh, I think the book makes very important interventions. And the, some of them came up in your talk. Uh, although many of them, are, it, it was I mean, your talk was focused on one of the chapters, right? The chapter on uh, exposures. But uh, I, I thought I'd just, you know, sort of zoom out a little bit and look at also some of the other interventions that you make uh, in your book. Um, just a little, just a few of them. Uh, and of course, the the most fascinating premise that uh, the book makes is, is the juxtaposition, right? Is a juxtaposition of uh, nuclear plants on the one hand and cell phone reactor, a uh, cell phone antennae uh, on the other. So uh, they are juxtaposed via metaphor and mediation. So um, uh, what uh, Rahul does is he deploys this uh, very productive metaphor of uh, radiant infrastructures. Um, and I quote uh, from the book, uh, at once glowing symbols of an aspirational post-colonial modern and radiating potentially carcinogenic emissions. Um, uh, this is from the book. Uh, so phenomena like, like radiation, what uh, Timothy Morton in his object-oriented ontology would call hyper-objects, right? Things that are massively distributed in uh, time and space uh, relative to humans and therefore resist uh, localization. And uh, that, is, uh, that indeed is the challenge for both representation as well as mediation of these kinds of uh, hyper objects. And what the book does, what your book does is actually make manifest the local. Um, so especially in this chapter from your book that you just presented to us, um, you know, why are, the, uh, why are the effects on surfaces? So surfaces, for example, on the skin, uh, on the body and on uh, media texts. So um, for that reason, uh, I, I also like this particular chapter uh, uh, the most among, uh, among all of them. Um, so uh, does cell phone, I mean, this is one of the, uh, one of the uh, uh, hypotheses of your book, right? You say, uh, you ask, does uh, cell phone radiation cause cancer? Now, um, a quick Google search uh, on this will uh, give us returns like uh, not proven or words like alleged, or uh, sometimes just an emphatic no from uh, the official releases of, uh, say, the food, uh, the FDA, the Food and uh, Drug Administration USA, etc. So where 
such fears have been officially uh, quashed um, and uh, unofficially too, since the um, since the sort of the penetration uh, has been so ubiquitous. Uh, there's been a sort of a quid pro quo, right, where uh, we accept the dangers of an imperceptible, uh, yet to be proven uh, cell phone radiation, just as or even more, uh, actually, more than we do uh, the dangers of, say, signing away our private data, for example. Um, so this uh, makes me uh, uh, curious, uh, and this is one of the questions that I had, which maybe uh, we could address later, uh, about the periodization uh, of this research, because I understand that must have been a field work which then later leads to the book and all of this takes uh, time as we know. And, um, but however, uh, having said that, it continues, of course, uh, absolutely continues to be relevant because uh, the emphasis in the book is not so much on uh, hard scientific evidence, right? That supports or disproves uh, the radiation theory, uh, but the threat perception rather uh, than the threat itself. So the, it's the threat perception that is being sort of mediated and uh, sort of explored in your book rather than actually uh, the threat. And um, so, so, so on the one hand, um, there is a very real, very real and proven risk of uh, radiation on bodies in uh, close uh, proximity to the Kurangulam um, uh, nuclear plants uh, following the level seven uh, accidents at Fukushima and Chernobyl, which alerted the world to this kind of uh, uh, danger. Uh, and on the other hand is the risk perception of cell phone antenna radiation. Uh, so it exists at the level of uh, perception in that we don't have uh, conclusive evidence in support or against it, whether it be because of the corporates and all of that, uh, but still we don't have any uh, absolute uh, uh, proof. So uh, by juxtaposing uh, these two, what the book achieves uh, is a dissolution of boundaries between uh, evidence and perception. Um, so your, your methodological and theoretical resolution of this uh, is to study the phenomenon itself via mediation. In other words, the ways in which this uh, risk perception is mediated rather than to quantify or qualify the risk, right? So um, just a little sort of a tangent here, but uh, in an interview uh, uh, somewhere, I don't uh, exactly recall where, but you uh, make a sort of analogy with uh, the COVID, uh, current sort of COVID uh, uh, phenomenon, the, the pandemic. And, um, you, you know, so, so I think it's a very apt sort of uh, analogy because uh, at any given point, uh, it's shrouded in uh, mystery. So uh, we may know the truth uh, years hence, but right now all we can understand is the phenomenon itself, right? The whole sort of way of life that is being uh, precipitated by the pandemic, the lockdowns, the, the protocols, the sort of um, surfaces that uh, emanate uh, risk and all of that. And um, so, 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 so then how does one cope? So, so this is something like what, what you say, you know, in, in cultures of the cultures of uncertainty, right? So uh, how do we cope with uh, something like a pandemic? It is the same as we cope with, um, um, you know, another sort of culture of uncertainty, which at that time when the cell phone uh, uh, towers were coming up, the, there was always this this uh, risk perception that, you know, for example, the citizen uh, that you uh, show, the citizen journalism, who's looking at the cell towers that are being constructed opposite his house and getting really uh, agitated. Um, so the focus, uh, like I uh, like we said before, is not so much on scientific evidence, right? Uh, but the mediation of science in popular uh, discourse. So, uh, and uh, Rahul traces this through the, in, what he calls the intermedial flows uh, in a staggering array of media artifacts uh, that are marshaled here, documentaries, TV shows, news reports, advertisements. Um, so from uh, PSAs to uh, nat uh, National Geographic, um, 
television shows and all of this. And uh, I found the use of the contrapuntal method, I'm uh, referring to uh, Edward Said here, to, to track these uh, implicit hierarchies and contrasts. So urban versus rural, vernacular versus elite, uh, an urban lifestyle show like uh, Living It Up versus a local newspaper like a uh, uh, vernacular newspaper like Rajasthan Patrika, uh, serious versus non-serious journalism, um, uh, activist documentary versus films division documentary, Facebook versus Twitter. So all of these things make a fascinating mapping of this um, very complex media terrain, right? The, via the notion of the uh, environmental publics which is of course one of the key takeaways uh, of the book. And you uh, spent some time talking about it. So I'm just uh, going to uh, um, say very little about that. Uh, so the, um, uh, just to sort of recap, the, the um, environmental publics um, are, you know, all the, all the people that uh, Rahul mentioned, the activists, scientists, policy makers, film media professionals, uh, concerned victims, potential victims, uh, all of them who articulate their uh, anxieties as well as aspirations, right, around uh, medial, uh, modern uh, digital infrastructures and their relationship to the environment. And uh, what is interesting is uh, something you didn't uh, fully sort of uh, explain in your talk, but uh, it's, it's sort of... Um, map through the various controversies, right? The, so the, the um, um, he says, so I quote here, publics who articulate contesting views about the relations between modernity, wireless signals and nuclear power. So uh, central to all of this is the role of media and by implication, uh, media infrastructures. Uh, so cell phone antenna, for example, would be uh, an actant to use uh, Latour's uh, term in the network. And uh, what is interesting uh, for me is that it is tracked via an affective rather than a discursive uh, register. And um, I see this articulation as having an afterlife, as in it, it's a sort of a, a modular concept that can be used uh, for other publics. So uh, you can, you know, like, for example, secular publics, we can use this sort of same uh, methodology, so to speak, uh, to, to um, track other kinds of publics and therefore it's again a very uh, 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 productive concept that has a life beyond uh, the immediate context uh, of, of the book. Um, so in order to trace these, um, uh, you know, these environmental uh, publics through these controversies, etc., you, you also set up a few oppositional discourses, right? And um, uh, I just want to point out a few uh, uh, depending on, on the time. So um, one is between uh, the symbolism of the nuclear plants, uh, what has also been called uh, uh, by, by other scholars as nuclear nationalism, and uh, the painful reality of the radioactive emissions. So uh, the documentary that you talk about, which is R.P. Amudan's um, radiation stories, uh, we see this very explicitly in the stark close-ups of malformed radiation victims, punctuated by the, if, if people have seen the film, um, you know, the malformed radiation victims are punctuated by the Vande Mataram song, which is being played uh, against the backdrop of the nuclear plant. So uh, not only are we forced to see the grotesqueness of the national symbol, uh, but also of the radiation victims and their families captured by Amudan's uh, visceral shots. Um, so another uh, oppositional discourse that is uh, explored in the book uh, is between science and uh, vernacular or folk wisdom, right? And um, again, uh, the book offers uh, a critique of science, not, not uh, exactly science, but the, the uh, uh, bureaucratic delivery of the scientific establishment in India. So uh, the radiation is not only an instance of the imperceptible uh, slow violence, what Richard Nixon calls the slow violence and what you have termed Khamosh uh, Khatra, um, but it's, it's rendered doubly imperceptible by the state's science bureaucracy, which is always uh, shrouded in mystery. Um, and here the role of mediation, that is uh, journalists and documentary 
filmmakers who unravel this um, become important, even if they are co-opted or circumscribed by uh, what uh, Howard Cagle calls the arcanum, uh, the state's monopoly of secrets and information. And this is particularly uh, uh, relevant to the nuclear uh, establishment in India. Right? Um, so the, the fact that the book does not valorize uh, science or create a hierarchy between science and uh, cultural or folk wisdom is, is, is interesting. Uh, and it's uh, worth uh, recalling here uh, the anecdote that you uh, cite in your book, which you did not mention today, but which is a very interesting um, uh, encounter that you had during your field work with the uh, sort of with the person who uh, deferred to the peacock's sensitivity, right? The peacock's sensitivity to wireless signals over the EMF uh, detectors. That is, uh, the, so, so that was very interesting. And it was only when the peacocks returned to his garden that he finally believed that he was out of the danger zone. So, um, I see, and I see this as a very fine uh, balancing act between uh, what you call the vernacular mythologies of the everyday. Um, uh, and uh, because it, uh, you know, the danger is that it's always perilously close to being uh, what a modern scientific temperament would call superstition or vehem or something like that. So how does one reconcile uh, Indian modernity's quest for a scientific temper uh, with these sort of local wisdoms uh, without slipping into uh, what could easily be um, construed as a sort of Hindutva style, pseudo scientific, you know, that kind of discourse. So, but you do a very fine, I think a very fine balancing act of actually, uh, you know, keeping that uh, balance from not tipping into any one uh, direction. Um, so I thought that was very, um, in very interesting uh, oppositional discourse there. Um, another opposition uh, that you set up is, uh, is between uh, livelihood activism and uh, post-materialist uh, lifestyle activism, right? Post-materialist meaning uh, after the material needs are taken care of, after livelihood needs are taken care of, then uh, you have your... Uh, sort of, um, you know, lifestyle activism, your, your backyard, uh, you're spoiling my backyard activism. And um, so the activism against the Kudangulam a nuclear plant uh, as an instance of the environmentalism of the poor, uh, of, in, of livelihood activism, where livelihoods are at stake, and activism against cell phone antenna radiation taken up by urban elites and celebrities like Juhi Chawla. Uh, as instances of uh, lifestyle activism. So uh, where lifestyles uh, are at stake. So this uh, oppositional discourse that you set up between bourgeois envi uh, environmentalism and uh, environmentalism of the poor, Kudangulam uh, activism versus cell phone radiation activism, urban versus rural, etc. cetera. Um, that, uh, I wonder if th those boundaries are precisely uh, what are getting recast today with, uh, uh, you know, with uh, this sort of digital activism and what's happening now when, for example, Rihanna, uh, far away Rihanna tweets on farmers protests and creates a, a sort of a whole a set of events uh, and, and uh, also with more dire consequences, um, a continuum is established already between uh, the Kudangulam activists, um, where the entire village of Idhidangarai uh, in Tamil Nadu uh, was booked for sedition, right? The, so, so uh, was booked for sedition for protesting against the nuclear plant. And uh, this is in 2011. And so that would be one of the first cases of that kind of uh, 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 slapping of sedition uh, uh, in this environmental uh, protests uh, movements and uh, making a direct lineage to uh, young uh, urban climate change activist Disha Ravi who was arrested under the same charges, sedition charge. So there's a sort of a, a way in which now the two are sort of not, we are not able to clearly, uh, you know, uh, separate the two, two uh, kinds of activisms, I think. Um, so uh, finally, uh, since I've been given 10 minutes. So finally, I would say that the book reconciles uh, a largely human story 
with a uh, non-human one, uh, where non-subjects, uh, if we call, uh, if we want to call objects non-subjects, then um, they take a life of their own, right? As Jane Bennett argues in her book, uh, Vibrant Matter. So uh, along with the radiant infrastructures, uh, the cell phone towers uh, and nuclear reactors, you uh, explore the non-human bird figure of Pakshi Rajan in the wonderful analysis of the Rajnikanth film in uh, Endiran, uh, in the conclusion of the book, which completely made my day. Um, because, you know, after the reading the whole book and then you get this wonderful uh, conclusion. Um, and um, so you introduce peacocks, um, aluminium foil, microwave ovens uh, uh, as dramatis personae, right? In this uh, very intriguing story of uh, human and non-human entanglements. So thank you uh, very much for your uh, book. Thank you for your presentation. And we would love to hear more about your uh, new work, which again sounds uh, very, very uh, fascinating. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Veena. That was, uh, that was really nice and, and comprehensive. And uh, so Rahul, you have the option of, uh, you have the option of uh, coming in now if you want on on Veena's comments or you could we could gather more questions i also have some com you know comments and questions we could you know, we could do two three rounds what do you prefer uh, would you want to respond to Veena now I, I promise to be short in this <laughs> I'll, I'll just like to thank <laughs> Veena for this really uh, like amazing uh, discussion and especially for thinking in a kind of meta way about the research approach uh, thinking about like evidence and perception and, and threat perception. And I, I kept thinking that threat perception along with evidence has its own kind of uh, epistemology. And I was trying to sort of work through that. Um, yeah, I mean, uncertainty with the COVID-19 and in this moment also uh, with some of my cases around cell antennas and, and nuclear reactors, I think like uh, the cultures of uncertainty, so thanks to Veena for bringing that out because I didn't quite talk about it. But yeah, I think at one level, it could be understood almost as misinformation and as, you know, something vernacular mythology bordering on conspiracy theory. But at the same time, these are also very important kind of uh, moments where people are really coping with their uncertainty and trying to make sense of it um, and trying to sort of live their lives amidst all this uncertainty. So they need to perhaps um, believe in the peacocks so when you know they can't quite believe in the radiation detectors or the people who are making those detectors or they can't believe whether the cell antenna signals are being kept beyond or below a certain threshold so uh, yeah I mean all the stuff that you said are is all great and maybe I'll uh, keep returning to them as with some of the other questions Thank, thanks a lot Mina. Uh, thank you, thank you, Rahul, and and I'll just be throwing open the floor to my uh, to the people in this room, uh, and and we may have questions. You know, if people are listening in. You can send in your question uh, on, on the chat. So one or two quick quick comments. Uh, apart from the fact that I really enjoyed your book, and uh, one of the things I really liked about it is the amount of work you put in, uh, and and. This <laughs> <laughs> because you dealt with vernacular stuff, you've traveled everywhere in India, you've met everyone, and what is nice is some of the films you've you know dealing with we, has been shown in this very room. Uh, so so you know Buddha Buddha waves a Jadugoda, Fatima's film. So you know it's very nice. So this I really like the amount of work you put in. It just shows when dealing with such a complex thing, you have to put in this kind of material material work. Uh, you know we have a lot of theory heavy uh, stuff coming out, which is also important. Important. But I think I also like this. So two, 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 two comments really. One is the problematization. Uh, three comments actually. A problematization of testimony, which happens with this production of uncertainty. Right? Uh, testimony becomes a challenge. So how do you how do you produce testimony? Is it by reinvoking? And this is a challenge for documentary. I think art has opened up. You know. My, more interesting stuff here. Do challenge with documentary, do you project the vulnera vulnerability of the human body when dealing with something that is not yet clear, you know, and, and this, is, this has always been a challenge, right? So some people, 
uh, you know, people uh, like people from forensic architecture with whom we've had a very close relationship, uh, like Susan Shupley, uh, you know, talk about the testimony, how material becomes test, you know, becomes testimony, uh, you know, enters the testimonial zone. You know, she's looked at strips of film that that have led, you know, the, one of her, you know, her points about Chernobyl is about how s film suddenly darkens in that moment, right? So material forms collide and come together and enter the realm of the testimonial, you know, what, what Wiseman calls objects rearrange the forum. That's one way, right? So this this tension of the body, we know the human body is reframed with the coming of the of digital media we know that but the the challenge of narrating this testimonial is is is, is i think a, a critical challenge that's one the other thing which i think is uh, implicit in your thing which is this whole theory of the split public which is <laughs> which is this dra it's kind of a it's a kind of a dramaturgy of political democracy which is what the split public theory uh, goes like this and it, it, it happens in various where there's there's, an, there's there's a there's a liberal elite uh, which which focuses on reason evidence etc cetera, etc cetera, uh, which, uh, which 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 has this vo you know voice of god discourse in television broadcast there, there's a, you know there are there's very bit small bit of television that talks like this in india but overall this is the theory and and affective media at the vernacular level and affective publics, which are, which may or may not be drawn by this idea of rational thought. And we see a bit of this coming up all, you know, there's a way in which this is, your work, I think, disrupts it and complicates it. You don't take it on, which is good. You actually open up other, you, you open up different flows because this is a problem. Actually, it's a, it's a, it's a genuine problem of political democracy. We see it coming back again in different ways. Uh, political populism has sought to collapse both these realms, right, worldwide. On the other hand, with the pandemic, we hear, you know, you know, trust the science, trust the evidence, you know, don't trust the misinformation. You have different versions of this playing. But what is nice is you, you actually blur it a bit. You introduce different cuts and flows, right? And, and I think that's, that's a nice way of going about it, rather than saying it is wrong. The other thing, uh, which I, I think I'll come back to that later. I think I think I'll you know I'll, I'll put this in as a comment and I'll I'll open this up to the to the floor. Yeah, Ravi Vasudevan. Sorry. Yeah, uh, I have only read half the book. But I really enjoyed that half, and uh, uh, but Vina has given such a wonderful, comprehensive picture of the rest of it. We got signposts all, all the way along down to the Indiran conclusion, which I'm really looking forward to. Anyway, <laughs> uh, no, it, mine was just a much more uh, precise uh, question, zoning in on this question of the environmental public, uh, because there seems to be a, a series of shifting registers through which you actually kind of uh, uh, discuss it, how you frame it. Uh, and one of these is actually that at one point you say it's actually constituted by disruption, if I remember correctly. Uh, this is one kind of uh, proposal which you make at a certain point, which I understood the logic of because publics are just not there. They have to actually be constituted by some set of things which happen to produce them. But at the same time, one must presume that publics are also actually kind of cultivated over time through a whole series of practices which may range from, you know, instruction, education, whatever. And that surely is a, another dimension of where ex how exactly an environmental public would be composed. The other thing is, of course, the powerful dimension of what you are doing, which is about how it's, uh, uh, the objects and the subjects of this uh, mutually constitute uh, this environmental public, uh, so that you have your radiometers and, the, and also the actual system of circulation itself becoming a, a critical vector of that. So that w w one interesting moment in this shifting register is when you actually come to the, the two different sites, the com uh, contrast between two sites, which is the cell phone tower and the actual the nuclear factory. And it's in this that uh, the nuclear factory's penetration, unlike the cell phone tower, which is much more easily penetrable, you can go in and see how it's put together. Uh, is actually governed by a certain type of uh, pro-filmic space, isn't it? It's actually to do with how, how things are organized for you to see them. And there's a prescription on what you can see and what you can't see. 
there's also not only a prescription, therefore that we can, you know, uh, the, the figures you have referred to as journalists who uh, actually seem to kowtow and accept the protocols of what can and cannot be seen is one thing like a form of embedded kind of scientific journalism, I suppose. But the other side of the coin is that there's actually a shifting register of what could potentially compose the environmental public at this, at this point. There could be the engineer, it could be the worker, there could be other figures who could potentially come into view. So this you know, shifting configuration of what composes the environmental public, I think was very suggestive. So that's parking one thing. The other thing is the question of the aesthetic, you know, and there is the ways in which the mediatic form uh, which actually is a key vector of how you actually navigate uh, through this, you know, this uh, the, uh, the environment uh, is actually uh, there are a number of different potential things, the talk show and, you know, this kind of multiple screens and, and that kind of stuff. I was struck by uh, two things. One is the ways in which uh, the new nuclear reactor and the actual kind of cell phone tower are kind of imaged in terms of a certain kind of landscaping or cityscaping. And that struck because you've got a wonderful set of, in fact, the first thing I did was to go through all the photographs before I started reading anything, because you've got some remarkable stuff there. And those counterpoints actually also kind of overlaps. Sometimes you get a feel, these are not just counterpoints. So the, the, the thing in the background, you know, the object which, from which everything is emanating in the background of the human subject in the foreground becomes is, is in a peculiar sense shared, you know? So you can actually have the figure as actually vulnerable in a, to a remote, entity, which you are then going to, or the documentarist is going to actually kind of pull out the meanings of this kind of relationship. So there's something about that aesthetic, which actually seemed to also confirm this problem of a split public in the very imaging of how you compose it. I thought it's wonderful stuff around Amudam and his refusal to have any presence of anyone except the people affected. You know, there would be no other figures in this space, you know, in radiation stories. So there, there's a refusal that uh, certain parts of the public I am screaming, screening off, you know, it's, it's almost like a documentary act, which is taking place. But there, it seems to be wh what I think you're doing also is that in, in kind of putting a quotation marks around split public, the actual ways in which an aesthetic is actually kind of being framed and uh, the ways they may actually traverse spaces, because arguably, it's not just the middle class activist and lifestyle urbanist who's actually kind of involved in, you know, her background, back, back, backyard and how it's composed or it's, it's obviously these are things which affect all of us at one level. So there's a way the relationship between the, uh, the actual radiate, ra radiating ent entity and the actual composition of bodies in space seem to actually aesthetically, you know, develop an argumentation of which is unsettling some of this. Me, while, of course, radically uh, reinstituting the question of rural urban, which has come to our minds every day now, uh, in a sense, with the, with the farmers' agitation. So, Rahul, you want to respond? Should we get, take more questions? What, what did you prefer? Maybe I can quickly respond. It'll be very uh -huh. short. Okay. Okay. Uh, so both, I think it goes well, both uh, with uh, the, both the Ravi's questions, one on aesthetics and another on the testimonial. I just wanted to say like uh, that it is, a, it is an interesting moment. I'll just maybe provide a short anecdote uh, with Amudan. I asked him, uh, you know, like, I mean, the kind of his continuity with a particular kind of politically committed filmmaking has been, his kind of endurance with it has been quite fascinating to me. And I asked him once, about you know his one of his favorite filmmakers and he said and he he mentioned patricio guzman and i said well you know guzman has been making a different kind of film films now from battle of chile to now nostalgia for light and he said i continue to love the guzman of uh, of uh, battle for chile so 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 there is something there i think with that uh, endurance um and um to the other question on uh, on um I, I think I was trying to, I think the, the whole public thing for me, I basically I'm obsessed with that term perhaps, and I've used it too many times in my chapter titles and article titles also, but it's also like the way in which it's been approached by so many different people makes for interesting reading. And I, I, I as much as I wanted a certain kind of idea of, you know, issue-based publics based on disruption breakdown, I also wanted to get out of it because, um, 
the kind of organizational um, aspect needed for particular kinds of publics to appear uh, or you know um, join together was very different from a kind of um, you know a kind of people's movement kind of environmentalism of the poor quote idea vis-a-vis uh, -vis a kind of bourgeois environmentalisms of so-called concerned citizens and a kind of resident welfare. So the organizational dynamics of constituting a public or coming together uh, and the kind of breakdown dimension, I wanted to sort of put it all together. Yeah, I I'll stop at that. So Pratima, uh, my colleague, Pratima Ben. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> hi, uh, Rahul. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the presentation. And I'm really looking forward to reading the book. Um, so I want to, it, it's, it's uh, largely in continuity to what uh, Ravi Vasudevan particularly was saying. Um, I, I want to think more with you on the, uh, on the salience of using the concept of the public in the kind of work that you're uh, doing. Uh, one thing which Ravi already mentioned is that coming, uh, coming from environmental studies scholarship, there is a deep questioning of the earlier ways of imagining publics uh, as necessarily multiple and plural or split or hierarchized or, and so on. In the sense that many environmental scholars would say that uh, a toxic air or a virus or radiation uh, breach uh, borders between publics in a way in which traditional uh, sociological or uh, urban rural kind of divisions do not really work when we think with these kind of flows. So that's one large question uh, uh, that, uh, so it's interesting for me that you continue to use the term public as, as it were, uh, in a context which challenges the very conceptual foundation of that uh, idea, which comes primarily from human political uh, 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 contexts, right? So the other aspect of this uh, uh, question then becomes the human non-human uh, uh, axis, which is so central to your work, um, where on the one hand, the idea of the public um, kind of sits uneasily with the idea of the assemblage, right? Of the cell tower, the, the, the nuclear reactor, the virus, and the human. Um, so would you think that, you know, I mean, what comes out of this friction between the human cent centricity of the notion of the public and the imagination of infrastructure? Um, and uh, so, so that kind of interests me. Uh, so when you give those, uh, the other thing is that, uh, of course, and this is again coming out of primarily my half understanding of environmental scholarship, which is to say that the almost always the way in which uh, questions of radiation or virality become political questions are by being transformed into questions of public health rather than in terms of environment or ecology or ambience or virality as such. Uh, so, you know, and my hunch is that all the, all the visualizations and the mediations that you demonstrate are all at heart centered on the question of human health, right? So that question and the question of the human non-human entanglement. Um, I'm just, you know, trying to think with you in where we are going with this kind of an analytical framework. Thanks. <laughs> but this is, of course, yeah. before I have read your book, so maybe yeah. much of the questions are uh, irrelevant. Thank you, Pratima. I Ravi Kant, and then Shana. Hi. 
Hi, uh, Rahul. Thanks. And uh, I'm tempted to read the book. Uh, so I want to, you know, follow in on uh, some of the things that Veena flagged. Uh, and, and the discussion, you know, continues in that direction. Uh, uh, so how is this, you know, uh, desire also, right? How does that play a role uh, in the, the entire drama? Uh, our desire for constant upgradation from 2G to 3G to 4G to 5G, right? And so on. So that I think it's, is, 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 is also a, a bit of a familiar story. Just as there, there's a familiar story in the towers, uh, transmission towers, uh, and you know, uh, into going into the clouds, very much in harmony with nature, and bringing uh, the film songs, for example, into our drawing rooms, uh, and those images in cinema. Uh, so there's a continuity. Those who want electricity would want it, right? Uh, whether we have, uh, you know, big dams or not, but yes. Uh, or Himalayan tragedies uh, ad nauseum. So, but uh, so, so, who, uh, what is this machine that builds this desire? The Google search, you know, results that Veena, uh, you know, hinted at. Uh, so, so, if the management is happening at practically all the levels and across, I would say, the, uh, 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 you know, rational vernacular divide, so to speak, very crude divide. But it is happening across in Hindi media also. Are you very, uh, this Rajasthan Patrika example is a very good one. That actually there is no, uh, there's, a, there's a seamless flow of one kind of image. Uh, what is beneficial to you? What would, And then this thing that uh, you will lack, right? Because you need uh, 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 all, the, all the Netflix, all the OTT, all the YouTube, everything you have to have 4, 5g right so this, this this there's a kind of there's a kind of whole economy that creates this desire you know uh, uh, rendering everything else that belong to past irrelevant including you know concern for a particular way in which you could preserve your health so uh, and we have to i, I compliment you uh, i mean uh, the way you uh, seem to have written the book right we have to find ways of writing uh, about these things and i think you've been uh, you are being uh, quite innovative there thank you shanak said Uh, hi, Rahul. Uh, thanks. That was a really lovely talk. I've also actually read your book fairly closely, especially the introduction and the conclusion. Um, the, so I, my question is connected to the non-human um, aspect that Prathama introduced. So uh, in, the, uh, in the capacity of the more than human valences of infrastructure. So in the two kinds of avian figures that were introduced between the, the radioactively precocious peacock and the songbird that is used in the advertisement uh, that you showed, it feels like there are two different kinds of invocations of uh, non-human life, where in the peacock, you have the bird as the sentinel creature that is sounding the bugle on uh, radioactive, uh, uh, radioactive capacities going up. And on the other hand, with the bird, there's a different kind of an invocation. And I'm particularly interested in the fact that we, we now know that uh, exclusion zones like Chernobyl and Fukushima are also places where flora and fauna and megafauna is really flourishing. Like new kinds of new subspecies of wolves, of different kinds of red kites are really flourishing. So there is a whole, in fact, uh, people like Matthew Gandhi and Timothy Morton have started talking about how the post-apocalyptic scenario of a nuclear sort of uh, event might be beneficial for a large number of megafauna and certain kinds of flora and fauna. So how one thinks of this, the radiant infrastructure in terms of the, through the lens of more than human infrastructure is interesting, especially when it feels like between the radioactively precocious peacock and the bird image that you showed in the advertisement, uh, there's something going on, which is interesting. Yeah, I think Rahul, you can come in if you want to respond to, uh, if you want to respond. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, maybe first to Professor uh, 
Banerjee's question, and I, I'm a big fan. I've been reading elementary aspects of the political. I wish I had read it before. Uh, so I think you point to something which is uh, which is there uh, a kind of tension in the work between using a term like assemblages vis-a-vis -vis using a term like publics, and uh, certainly that is a tension in the book. Um, but I, uh, in the kind of science studies literature, uh, there has been a like I think there was also a movement around which was more about around assemblages, but it became more and more this idea of non-humans being part of publics as a kind of discussion, which just became more, I, I don't know, was normalized. Um, one of the ways to think about it is uh, what comes to matter in even constituting things like what Michel Callan would say, kind of these hybrid forums where different stakeholders come and what can also perhaps matter is is um, are particularly non-human um, agents or actants in that sense. Um, there's also another kind of writing uh, in the in, by say Marisol de la Cadena and others in the kind of indigenous cosmoplastics room, sort of working through Isabel Stenger's work, which also thinks through what non-humans uh, and what part they play in 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 publics. Um, I was trying to reconcile a certain kind of discursive, um, affective. Um, and material registers together and publics because of the kinds of different approaches to publics that were there. I could find a way where I could even talk about very discursive contestations and also talk about very aerated slash atmospheric aspects of publics at the same time. So just because there is a, such a heterogeneous literature on publics that helped because I really wanted to have Michael Warner's idea of publics in a concept which I could also use to think about thanks to Necht and Kluger in a very different context of at atmospheric, uh, atmospheric. So, so partly that is the reason, but uh, indeed there are tensions and oftentimes I've thought about whether I should use the term publics or assemblages. And again, there was the same tension between using, um, um, between sort of, uh, uh, you know, thinking about whether I should call it environmental publics or health publics uh, at the same time. But because my approach had a lot of ecological aspects to the way I was going about doing the research, I, I sort of stuck with environmental publics. Um, but yeah, but those tensions that you point out are absolutely like spot on. There were tensions I was trying to reconcile, but I can never quite reconcile them. Um, uh, to R Ravi Khan's question, I think desire is huge and maybe I should have even discussed it more in terms of, I think from what you were saying with this, you know, 2G, 3G, 4G, and as we are waiting for 5G in India, or in some cases, some places are, uh, they've been talking about ultra fast 4G and how there's been an optical fiber cable from, you know, Chennai to the Andaman Nicobar Islands archipelago for us for certain kind of ultra fast 4G networks for the first time. And I think there is, there is something to be said about that. And I was also thinking about James Ferguson's work around, you know, who needs electricity? Who determines electricity? Should there not be electricity? And so why not nuclear power as much as uh, many of its kind of paralyzing possibilities as well? So, so those are there. And, um, and to, to, to Shonak's question, yeah, I think we have to think about different kinds of sensitivities and that some of the sensitivities to some of these radiations by different species would be very different and would have, it, is it possible that as much as it could have debilitating effects on some, it could have um, kind of generative effects for others or uh, though the, the whole flourishing flora and fauna thing, how much of it is really happening and how, uh, and at what scale is still, is still being, is, is still being debatable. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, in the sense that Donna Harrow has always said that, you know, in, in a kind of, post-apocalyptic situation, it's possible that there will not be perhaps humans, but other species might still flourish. And I mean, that's that's been the discussion also, I guess. Thanks for all these great, great questions. Uh, thanks, Rahul. There are two questions uh, in the chat. Uh, one is uh, Himali, and Himali is asking, what are the texts you quoted about proximities and intimacies? I would say the first is your book. <laughs> Apart from that, you might have, I think you may have, you quoted a number of texts, maybe you can recall that. And the second, which you could see also is from San Sandeep Martia, whom you know. Uh, so Sandeep says, uh, they, they, you know, so I really enjoyed the book. It opens a different way 
uh, to look at media proliferations in the Indian context, apart from being a generative force for new kinds of intermedial formations, large scale proliferation, especially of the last couple of uh, decades, it also shifts the horizon of what is interme what is intermediality. I mean, what kind of possibilities exist and the ratio of different medial elements uh, in different contexts. So he's asking, what, what is your view of these elements and particularly your capacities to observe them closely or from a distance? How has it changed over the years? Uh, and and uh, so he's asking that both in a methodological sense, and I think he's going to begin, field, he's doing field work now. So it's a kind of a student question in that sense. And, <laughs> and okay, so, so the book uh, Rahul says is Animate Planet by Keith Weston. Okay, so, so you, you can get back to Sandeep, you can, you can reply to Sandeep, others can hear it. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't know what's uh, what's uh, what. I mean, so as I was writing, of course, uh, a lot of new writing was appearing. So there's a lot of literature in intermediality, thinking through uh, Matthew Fuller's work on media ecology. Uh, there's a lot of writing by Lisa Parks now, and thinking about coverage as not just media coverage, but but many of the other ways of thinking cross-platform, um, thinking about different elements. Uh, of course, Nichols uh, Staroselsky's work over time. Um, and um, so I was, of course, thinking about all these things. And I, and I also, um, I think some of the reviewers, uh, when they read my work, uh, also mentioned about thinking uh, not just about um, like a movement, not just from text to technologies, but also to techniques, which has been an important way in which say, scholars like John Durham Peters have thought about it. So say right now, thinking about maybe atmosphere in a different context amidst COVID-19 to think about these masks as maybe a particular kind of media, but the techniques of breathing, uh, which can come from many different places, um, uh, is, a, is a kind of technique which, which could also find its way into thinking about mediation um, at this moment, but is not exactly a technology. And I was particularly interested to move towards thinking about, because I was doing a lot of field work and was also inspired by a lot of work in anthropology around media practices, um, 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 so I, I try to also push towards this idea of how, how the kind of processual aspect within a kind of techniques literature, which seems sometimes to be too German centric uh, in a particular Kitlerian way could also be pushed towards thinking about practices. And I think others have also certainly done it like Brian Larkin thinking about um, radio loudspeaker sound. Um, yeah. Uh, I think if, uh, if there are any other questions, okay, it's been almost two hours.